Japan. But in June 1775, a small group of merchants, planters, and lawyers met in Philadelphia to see whether they might govern themselves. Thomas Jefferson of Virginia rented himself a room and began to circulate among the other delegates. Benjamin Franklin of Pennsylvania, Robert Livingston of New York, Roger Sherman of Connecticut, and a short, opinionated delegate from Massachusetts, John Adams, who would become Jefferson's friend, then his enemy, and then his friend again. Adams was as valuable as Jefferson was reticent, but he took to the young Virginian right away and thought him tough as a lignum knot. During the whole time I sat with him in Congress, I never heard him utter three sentences together. Though a silent member of Congress, he was so prompt, frank, explicit, and decisive upon committees that he soon seized upon my heart. John Adams. Jefferson is 33 years old. He's one of the youngest members of the Continental Congress of the United States. He's a provincial from Virginia. He has scarcely ever been out of his home state. He is a shy man. He has perhaps a slight speech impediment, and he has a high-pitched and weak voice and is not given to asserting himself in any way. He's considered a brilliant committee man, but he has no pre presence in the Continental Congress. He's not comfortable talking in public. He's not a great orator. In fact, he's, uh, even as a lawyer, not very good at making oral presentations to juries. He's much more comfortable crafting language in private where he has control. Over the next two years, Jefferson would serve quietly on 34 different committees. He was a master at drafting legislation, had what Adams called a happy talent of composition, and impressed everyone with his hard work. But he was privately suffering. I have never received the scrip of a pen from any mortal in Virginia since I left it, nor been able by any inquiries I could make to hear of my family. The suspense under which I am is too terrible to be endured. If anything has happened, for God's sake, let me know it. In September 1775, his second daughter, Jane, had died at 17 months, leaving his wife so frail and grief-stricken that she could not even write to him. He was living in a three-mile-an-hour world. It would have taken him better than a week to travel the distance from Philadelphia to Virginia. And so, of necessity, Martha was alone a great deal of the time and, and suffered uh, she, she often went into states of depression because she wanted him with her and, of course, because she was losing these, these dear pledges, as Jefferson called them, one after the other. On March 31st, 1776, Jefferson's own mother died. Migraine headaches paralyzed him for weeks. Perfect happiness, I believe, was never intended by the deity to be the lot of any one of his creatures in this world. The most fortunate of us frequently meet with calamities which may greatly afflict us. And to fortify our minds against the attacks of these misfortunes should be one of the principal studies and endeavors of our lives. On June 7, 1776, Richard Henry Lee of Virginia introduced a resolution that declared that these united colonies are, and of right, ought to be free and independent states. Congress scheduled a vote on Lee's resolution for early July, hoping it would convince France to join their struggle against England, the mightiest power on earth. 
they established a committee to draft a Declaration of Independence to which all 13 colonists could subscribe. Benjamin Franklin was asked to write the first draft and refused. He made it a policy, he said, not to write documents subject to editing by others. Jefferson and Adams were assigned the task. Both Jefferson and Adams were committed to a republic, but they had very different styles. Jefferson was bland and careful and aphoristic and high-flown. His rhetoric always soared towards aspiration and, and to human dignity. Adams was earthy and anecdotal and pugnacious. Jefferson says, I think you ought to do it. And Adams says, no, three reasons. You must do it. First, you are a Virginian, and a Virginian must be at the head of this business. Second, I, John Adams, am disliked and obnoxious. And if I write it, it will lack credibility. And third, you are 10 times better a writer than I am. Not to find out new principles or new arguments never before thought of. Not merely to say things which had never been said before but to place before mankind the common sense of the subject in terms so plain and firm as to command their assent and to justify ourselves in the independent stand we are compelled to take. Alone in a rented room, Jefferson went to work. I would love to be there when he was writing the Declaration of Independence. He was in a little house on, on Market Street, writing on this wonderful desk. His servant, Bob Hemmings, was with him. He would serve him tea while he was working. He would play his violin periodically. And he would write without any notes. I would love to see him struggling for exactly the right word, the right phrase, trying to match the sound and the sense of each of the words, the cadences. Thinking through the ideas that he'd been studying, of John Locke, of Montesquieu, all the reading that he had done over the years. And as he struggled over each word, writing, crossing out, interlining, as he said. And then, as a page got too messy, copying it fair. It took him only a few days. The document, he said, was simply intended to be an expression of the American mind. He was able somehow to pick up on all the waves of thought that were going through from Paris to London, from the coffee houses to Boston. And all these ideas were coming in and coming in. What is a good country? What is a good way to live? What is a republic? Should we have a republic? What is a monarchy? What is a colonist? What are the relations between master and slave, the relationship between owner and uh, the owned? And he took all of this and in two or three sentences hurled it at the world. And it still goes round, it still inspires, and it is still the essence of whatever spirit we still have, and that we once had indeed. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station